Welcome back, everybody. Uh, good afternoon from Colorado uh, to the afternoon session of day three of ISART. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be focusing on monitoring. Uh, so we're going to start with a technical talk on spectrum monitoring, and then we're going to move to a panel of experts. We're going to explore options for effective and efficient spectrum monitoring and, and how to obtain usable data, and basically also what that usable data is, looking at that as the nexus of the feedback loop between design, deployment, and operations, right, and, and, and an obvious key to securing uh, the 5G radio layer. Uh, remember uh, that at the end of the panel, we're going to move to the breakout rooms where you'll have the opportunity to interact one on one uh, with your panelists uh, akin to uh, coffee breaks. Um, and not just the panelists, but also the technical speaker that I'm going to introduce next. So let me get right to that. Um, our next speaker is Doug Bulware. Uh, Doug has been uh, a fixture at ITS since 2017. He's a, a project leader and a senior developer for the Propagation Modeling website, and he's a senior software developer for the Spectrum Characterization Occupancy Sensing Spectrum Monitoring System, that's a mouthful, developed at ITS. So Doug is, is absolutely um, uh, deep in the bench of subject matter expertise on spectrum monitoring. So uh, let me go ahead and turn this over to Doug. All right, thank you, Andy. Uh, just lost slides. Ah, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity to uh, share some information on what I believe is a very exciting uh, project in spectrum monitoring uh, within NTIA's Institute for Telecommunication Sciences here in Boulder. Um, this project is led by Mike Cotton. He's the division chief in our theory division, and once again, my name is Doug Boyer. I'm a computer scientist and software engineer, and I oversee the software side of this effort. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to begin and uh, get into the motivation that drives this work, and then we'll go into some of the details on a real-world research and development environment uh, that, we were, that we're establishing known as uh, Boulder Wireless Test City. And then we'll hit on some key points uh, of a heterogeneous distributed and persistent monitoring capability that we're developing within the Boulder Wireless Test City. Next slide, please. So many in the audience are probably aware, ITS has a long and storied history in measurement and monitoring going all the way back to 1927. So you can see uh, in these various pictures, the evolution of our uh, uh, measurement and monitoring vehicles through the years. And uh, we have a more modern version of these uh, even today. Now, while the technology has changed uh, over the years, the basic concept has remained the same, and that is that we uh, assemble laboratory-grade measurement equipment into one of these vehicles, we'll take it to a fixed location for some duration of time, um, perform some measurements, and then we'll bring the data back to ITS, analyze it, and report on the findings. Next slide, please. Now, increasingly, though, um, we're being confronted with some challenges in this. So we all acknowledge there's increasing demand for finite spectrum. And the concern is that as we move forward, and particularly as we enter into uh, more dynamic usage of the spectrum, there's concern that there may be uh, increased occurrences or opportunities for unintended interference and degradation in our systems. And uh, on top of that, as we heard um, a little bit yesterday, you know, advances in technology have now made it far easier and cheaper um, for people to uh, jam systems or cause intentional interference in RF systems. Then compounding that issue, the fact that, um, you know, really wireless security tends to lag behind um, traditional cybersecurity. So you put all this together and you begin to sort of come to the conclusion that perhaps our traditional approach towards monitoring doesn't scale to the current and future challenges that we face. In addition, um, now even within ITS, there's some debate on persistent sensing or monitoring, but within you know, this group, we believe there's value in persistent sensing. And so as an example of that, um, I'll mention that several years ago, ITS deployed uh, sensors out at four coastal locations, to conduct uh, long-term uh, occupancy measurements in the CBRS band. So these charts on the, or these um, graphs on the top right are showing month, monthly occupancy levels uh, through the course of a year at each of these four locations. And what they're able to show over this um, long-term uh, monitoring activity is that 
sharing in this band actually may be viable. In addition, having these sensors out at these locations um, uh, collecting persistently also presented additional opportunities. Recently, there was some concern that uh, emissions from a Mexican wireless carrier could bleed across the border uh, and cause uh, interference potentially for our uh, FirstNet communications. We were able to uh, use the data that was being acquired from our San Diego sensor uh, to investigate this issue. You can see in the graph on the bottom, um, the blue highlighted region on the far right side shows that we actually were able to see uh, emissions or the um, the downlink from this uh, Mexican wireless carrier coming over into the uh, FirstNet uh, uplink band. Now, all of our experience in this area um, over time has also led us to the belief that in order to develop these new monitoring capabilities and uh, the broader suite of advanced uh, wireless technologies, we need a real a real world research and development environment um, to support that technology evolution. Next slide. So we're actively working to bring about a new future um, for spectrum monitoring. We're trying to fundamentally change the way we perform this monitoring. To do this, we've established a real world research and development environment known as the Boulder Wireless Test City. And we're using that environment currently uh, to develop a distributed, persistent, and automated spectrum monitoring capability. This uh, system is built upon heterogeneous sensors that utilize standardized and open source software and provide common metadata for the measurements uh, and uses automation for security and scalability. Next slide. So with um, Boulder Wireless Test City, what we've done is we've distributed sensors um, throughout Boulder and up at um, our Table Mountain field site and radio quiet zone. So this graph or the uh, map you're seeing has pins of different colors. So the, the green pins are showing sensors that we have um, currently deployed and, and are up and active. And then the yellow pins are showing uh, priority sites that we've identified for our next deployments. And then uh, red and blue pins are showing sites that are sort of under additional consideration. What we're trying to do here um, is deploy these uh, sensors throughout uh, a broad area to offer um, you know, several different RF environments. So uh, our radio quiet zone up at Table Mountain uh, has long been a valued asset um, of, of NTIA and ITSs that allows us to perform very controlled experiments. But now within Boulder Wireless Test City, um, we're able to expand into new uh, and interesting environments. So uh, through, by, by placing these sensors throughout Boulder in the, in the wider uh, region surrounding Boulder, we cover not only uh, different terrain, but also uh, areas that, that feature different spectrum activity. So down in downtown Boulder, we might have something that's um, more similar to an urban environment. And then as we move out, uh, we encounter a more suburban and then going even farther out, we get into a sort of rural um, spectrum environment. We're doing this with uh, an ongoing cooperative research agreement with uh, CU Boulder. This allows us to deploy RF sensors throughout their campus. We're also uh, actively working or engaged with the uh, Boulder Research and Administrative Network to identify uh, additional locations uh, and negotiate fiber access at their locations. Each of the sensors that we're deploying within the test city are also outfitted with our spectrum occupancy and characterization sensing or SCOS software um, that we'll go into some more detail on in a bit. Next slide. One of the things that we're trying to support within the Boulder Wireless Test City and more broadly as a monitoring capability, the notion of heterogeneous sensing. So the idea here is that uh, we can actually just customize sensors to suit the monitoring task at hand. Um, so certainly there are situations that require uh, more expensive uh, sensors or sensing equipment. And so an example of this is um, the sensor that we've deployed out to those coastal locations and within the Boulder Wireless Test City the diagram on the lower left. Um, this was a, a mid-range commercial sensor that we then outfitted with a custom pre-selector uh, to allow uh, more sensitive sensing in or measurements in a noisy environment. 
Now, uh, on the flip side of that, the diagram on the right shows uh, the, our inexpensive sensor that we refer to as the Greyhound that we've been experimenting with. And so we, we've built this sensor off of an uh, inexpensive uh, commercial SDR and uh, mini computer. But the idea here is that uh, across both ends, or you know, at both ends of the spectrum, pun intended, um, we're using COTS components that are interchangeable, and then we surround those with repeatable and automated uh, processes that allow us to calibrate the sensors as we go from lab to field. Next slide. Now, if we're talking about supporting um, heterogeneous sensors, right, we need we still need a way to interact with those sensors. So this is where our SCOS sensor uh, software comes in. The, the SCOS sensor software essentially just establishes a universal language or API uh, with which to interact with these different sensors. So this API allows us to um, interrogate the sensors and schedule tasks on them regardless of the underlying uh, sensors capabilities or manufacturer. We've um, built in or integrated support within this framework for two commercial SDRs. We've also open sourced this software um, in an effort to hope uh, to encourage others to provide additional uh, integrations for support for additional radios. Now the key to understanding what SCOS provides is uh, a notion of discoverable sensing actions. So an action is really just some sort of um, operation that the sensor can perform. But the thing to note here is that it's more than um, just the, the technical parameters of the, of, of the sensing. Actions allow you to also uh, encode additional post-processing on the data. So you can push processing of the RF data out to the edge of the network. And this has several advantages. One, you can reduce the amount of data that you're required to um, send back to the central repository. And then also you can reduce the amount of sensitive data um, that you may be sending across the network. In addition, these actions then also serve as sort of a research transition path. So whether you're a uh, researcher that is internal to ITS or uh, an external researcher, uh, you may be interested in signal processing or machine learning. So you can focus in on your algorithm development um, and then you can sort of package that as an uh, action using our SCOS sensor API. And now you have a means to distribute that capability out to sensors in the field. Each of the sensors also uh, features an onboard scheduler. So interacting with the API is really just as simple as interrogating the center, sensor to find out what capabilities it has or what actions it can perform, and then scheduling those actions um, at the de desired times and for the desired duration. Next slide. So our SCOS sensor software allows you to interact with um, an, an individual sensor, regardless of those underlying capabilities. But what we're after here is interacting with entire uh, distributed networks of sensors. So we've developed a SCOS manager software that provides centralized command and control over the entire network of sensors. This allows you to manage sensor schedules across the entire network, um, search and download archived RF data, and then also perform analytics and visualization over that data. Similar to how uh, SCOS sensor features uh, actions as kind of a specialization or injection point for uh, new capabilities. Uh, the manager also features a well-defined analytics API um, that serves as a similar function for both internal and external um, researchers. We're currently working on uh, obtaining uh, what's referred to as an authority to operate that will allow us to host uh, these capabilities off our ITS um, network and establish a website that will be available for authorized federal users, we hope, in uh, the first quarter of uh, FY21. Next slide. So one of the um, key things driving all of this is that we're trying to encourage both interoperability and reusability. And we're doing this on two fronts. So the first is through standardization. Um, we're working within the IEEE 802.15.22.3 working group to establish an IEEE standard for the APIs that's um, used by both the sensor and the manager. So this working group is chaired by uh, Aperva Modi. I believe he's in attendance today. Uh, and uh, I think the uh, draft eight is currently under circulation and we have hopes that it will go to the IEEE review committee 
uh, in September. Now, the other front um, on which we're, we're taking this is through establishing open source and common metadata um, for the broader community to use. Within SCOS, we've embraced uh, the SIGMF JSON metadata format. So we've established uh, nine additional SIGMF extensions and have um, pushed those out to a public GitHub repository. Um, and I should note here that you know, these aren't just out there for others to you know, kind of view and consume. Um, being in GitHub allows uh, other, other people to file issues or submit pull requests for changes or offer up additional extensions as well. Next slide. The final thing I want to hit on within um, this distributed and persistent monitoring capability is scalability and security. So we feel that uh, automation is actually the key to both of these. So we're actually automating um, the provisioning of the operating system and the software, as well as the maintenance uh, of that software throughout the system's lifecycle. So we're using Foreman to uh, uh, automatically deploy the operating system uh, to all of our edge devices, and then also perform status and monitoring. Um, we have also used Puppet to establish different, uh, essentially kind of configuration environments that allow us to um, pin the devices uh, in those environments to different versions of the software. So uh, as we mature the software, uh, we can automatically push upgrades to sensors in different environments. Um, Finally, uh, with regards to security and more specifically confidentiality and integrity, we're currently working to implement the security controls identified in this spe special publication 800-53. And then here too, we're using automation. So we have Ansible um, automatically deploying security harden hardening scripts to the edge devices after the operating system um, has been deployed to those devices. In addition, each of the sensors in the network are outfitted with a calibration and sensor definition file. And then these files uh, are used to populate the metadata uh, that's supplied with every acquisition or um, uh, sensing opera uh, operation the, the sensor performs. And finally, there's um, one aspect to actions that we didn't mention before that's an advantage. So um, the nice thing is that we can develop an action and we can actually put that action through lab verification, establish that um, you know, we've, we've verified that it's providing the data that it should and that we have uh, confidence in that data. Then once we've gone through this process, we can actually push that action into configuration management so we can have um, faith in that data as we go forward. Next slide. So I'll um, wrap things up here and just highlight uh, a couple points. Um, we've talked about how we've established Boulder Wireless Test City how we're using that environment to uh, mature this um, spectrum monitoring capability. Um, the point really here that I want to drive home is that we're, we're not sort of doing this research for research sake. The idea is to establish this environment in Boulder Wireless Test City that allows us to mature this capability so that we can then push it out and have a national impact with it. Um, so we've, we've currently established the ability to perform edge processing as well as coordinated sensing within this environment. As we move forward over the course of the next year, um, we're hoping to dive into really characterizing the RF environment um, within Boulder and the surrounding area. Uh, and then more broadly, as we go further down the line, we believe that um, Boulder Wireless Set Test City could be very useful in additional propagation model development and validation, and then further down the road in um, compliance validation as well as enforcement methods. We realize that these are uh, challenging issues that we're investigating so we know that um, we'll only succeed through partnering with industry, academia, as well as other federal agencies uh, in the development of these advanced spectrum technologies. Uh, and with that, if there's time, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we do have one question. Uh, it's can you repeat the full frequency range capability for SCOS? Uh, let's, so that's, I, Guess dependent more on the specific sensors that you have. So, um, uh, Mike may want to correct me on this in our uh, breakout afterwards. But um, the the cheaper, inexpensive uh, Greyhound sensor um, 
I'm not sure of the total range, but that one we've outfitted has been focused on monitoring 700 megahertz band. Um, that other mid sensor, mid range sensor um, that I talked about, I'm not entirely certain on this, but I believe it goes up to close to six gigahertz. I would check with Mike Cotton um, afterwards though on those details. He handles that side of things. <laughs> Fair enough, thank you, Doug. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for, for that talk. Uh, and remember everybody, Doug will be in a breakout room following the next panel uh, for additional questions. And I think that's the perfect introduction to the next panel uh, on monitoring and data collection. Uh, our moderator is Dr. Dr. Ashley Zotterer, uh, who is the program director in the Division of Astronomical Sciences within the Director for Mathematical and Physical Sciences at the National Science Foundation. Uh, her primary responsibility is electromagnetic spectrum management, where she works to represent the scientific interests for protection and use of electromagnetic spectrum, both within the United States and internationally. So Dr. Zotterer, you're a very busy person, and I think you're a great person to help moderate this panel. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much and welcome everybody to um, the third panel, Monitoring and Data Collection. We're very excited to have today um, five experts that combined have more than 125 years of relevant experience in um, data monitoring. It's very important as we think about securing the 5G layer that we get the feedback that we need from data, ongoing decisions related to design and deployment, in problems with ongoing operations, whether it's interference, it's intentional or not. I wanted to note that on this panel, it's great, we have representation um, both from academia, government, and private industry. There's um, DARPA Spectrum Challenge winners, folks who are a member of IEEE with many, many publications, and then also experience both within the United States and internationally. So as you hear the talks from these um, experts that you see on the screen, I would encourage you to type questions. Um, and if you see a question you like, um, make a note of that and I'll be watching so we can ask questions to the panelists. So now we will um, move to short presentations by each panelist and then we'll have some discussion afterward. So we'll start with Mark Gibson. Uh, Mark is responsible, responsible for developing domestic and international business opportunities for Comscope. He has over 36 years of spectrum management experience. He leads both technical and business development efforts um, for numerous wireless and spectrum related products and services. And it's also important to note that he's led efforts to address spectrum sharing between the federal government and commercial users, and also has significant experience and leadership responsibilities um, with regard to the CBRS efforts that have been ongoing. I'm a member of CSMAC. Um, he also has been a co-chair of working groups related to spectrum sharing and data exchange issues. And I also think it's really interesting to note that he is also a pilot. So when it comes to collecting data, he has experience actually collecting it um, from his airplane, which is exciting. So with that, I will pass it over to Mark for his presentation. Thank you. All right, well, thanks, Ashley. And I thank you for that introduction. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of give a background on a project that we worked on, uh, uh, and we worked actually closely with some of the folks from ITS uh, back in AWS3, which was about uh, seven or eight years ago, um, where we did some airborne spectrum monitoring that helped inform some of the spectrum allocation policies. I reckon spectrum allocation is probably a little strong, but at least uh, as spectrum sharing policies related to uh, commercial federal sharing of AWS3. So uh, next slide, please. So the premise going into the discussion is re really ba regulatory databases are really insufficient to fully characterize spectrum usage. You know, we find that, you know, all the, re the regulatory databases that we use in commercial are usually the FCC's databases and then federal folks use the GMF, which is the government master file. Um, you know, these are regulatory databases. They're not necessarily um, uh, engineering databases. And so not only do they lack the information, needed to do spectrum characterization, uh, they also sometimes contain air errors. Um, and so you generally need to get out there, and from Doug's presentation you saw earlier, um, spectrum monitoring is, is really the way to do that. Um, we find that spectrum occupancy measurements and uses measurements can help inform uh, decisions on how to use and share the spectrum, and that's what this presentation is supposed to show. And then I'll show you how we did this for AWS3. So next slide, please. So the idea behind this, this again goes back to the AWS-3. If you remember, the AWS-3 is the 1.7 and 2.1 gig band. The 1.7 is the uplink band, which is the lower power portion. 
And um, uh, that's what you see there in the diagram to the right. Um, and so this got pulled in under the Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee at the time uh, to study uh, how you could share spectrum with the various what they called equities at the time that are using that band. I believe there were a total of five different categories of those types of systems. Um, we were dealing in this situation actually with airborne one. And so what happened was CSMAC was formed, uh, formed these working groups, um, and there had been work done uh, initially by NTIA, uh, and then there was also additional work done within the context of the CSMAC work um, to characterize the facility for spectrum sharing, at least in the uplink. And we found that through the course of the discussions and interaction that the assumptions that we were using were really uh, worst case. So, um, or highly conservative. So what we wanted to do was to get, and actually in these worst case assumptions led to very large ex exclusion or protection zones around these systems. So what we wanted to do was to um, uh, find out what real world measurements indicated. Uh, and so that's what we did is we did uh, some real world spectrum occupancy measurements uh, at an airborne uh, uh, approach, uh, mostly because we wanted to characterize um, uh, something, what UE power looks like at an altitude that could approximate an air combat training system. So next slide, please. So what we did was uh, we did a series of airborne measurements over DC. Uh, I apologize, the diagram in the upper right is the same as the diagram in the upper left. I just noticed that. But um, uh, basically what we did is we flew arcs around the DC area with a spectrum monitoring system outfitted to the aircraft up to and including an external antenna. We use the CRF, CRFS RFI node, um, and uh, I don't have a picture in this in this presentation of that, but I can certainly show people if they're interested. And we de developed test plans to fly these circular arcs uh, at different altitudes just to characterize uh, UE power at altitude. And these altitudes, if you can see in the lower diagram to the left there, uh, the altitudes were at 1,000 foot increments between 3,000 feet and 10,000 feet where possible. Uh, as mo most people know, the DC is a complicated airspace. We also flew Norfolk, uh, and the idea behind that was to sort of decorrelate any multiple activity we saw from UE powers in DC, because at altitude, especially at 100, at 10, um, at uh, 10,000 feet, the radio horizon is about 120 miles. So uh, over DC, you're seeing Philly and other areas, and we felt down in Norfolk, you wouldn't be seeing that much. Um, and so basically, what we were trying to do was to characterize UE power at these altitudes so we could get a sense as to what effects clutter might have. And also we put a source in the DC area, a transmission source, so we could also just characterize propagation loss. And we worked with the folks at ITS to do some of this. And we were able to confirm from the test measurements that we collected that uh, propagation kind of uh, follows along IF-77, uh, which is an airborne propagation mod. actually follow very well. So that was good. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, um, that, that really states the results. <clears throat> so basically the results indicated that um, uh, the UE powers and altitude were less than predicted by the propagation models that were used for the original analysis. That ultimately does work on shrinking the, air, the, um, the uh, uh, protection zones for these air combat training systems. So if we had only relied upon uh, calculational methodologies to determine these uh, zones, we would have been restricted on spectrum use. Um, and so that's basically that shot of this. The other thing is we found at uh, altitude, given that you can see very far, we saw some road signal, rogue signals. So that blue uh, line there you see in the spectrum plot is a rogue signal, which we found interesting. So speaking of which, I have one more slide that's not part of this, it's a, C a CBRS. Can you go to the next slide, please? So um, we were curious early on in CBRS to care, see what the, what, um, the spectrum looked like um, in areas where w there shouldn't be any radar operations, or if there were, to see what radar operations looked like. So we did a little flight. Um, as Ashley said, I'm a pilot, so um, uh, we outfitted an aircraft with uh, the measurement gear and took a short flight about an hour and a half down to Richmond. We didn't land. We turned around and headed back up. Uh, and we had the CRFS gear going the whole time, measuring between 27 or 2,900 and 3,700. And what we saw was, if you look at the spectrum plot there, is also the waterfall, we saw basically was errant signals in bands where there should have been nothing. Um, we don't know what this is. Uh, we thought, and in fact, I sent this around to several folks, sort of off the record, just trying to find out what could be going on. 
Um, and so uh, this basically just underscores the, the value of spectrum monitoring. Uh, but not only that, but spectrum monitoring, uh, you know, above the clutter. Um, you know, again, we were at 11,000 feet, and so the horizon distance at 11,000 feet is 150 miles. So we could see a far piece, uh, but that was the intent of this effort because we wanted to see if we could see radar signals. But instead, we saw a lot of what you see in that upper, that spectrum plot, which was rather confounding, um, given that there shouldn't have been anything there. So if you go to the next slide, this summarizes my conclusions. So again, reliance on spectrum databases and regulatory information is insufficient. It's really important to get out and do some good measurements using good metrology. And, and you know, working with the folks at ITS, that is the best metrology you're gonna see. Um, it also informs uh, allocation considerations, especially if sharing is being considered. We're thinking perhaps that could be used in the new allocation for 3450 to 3550. Um, and that's basically it. We also think spectrum measurements can be used, ob obviously, for interference detection. We do a ton of that, but, you know, there's not enough time to get into that. So with that, I think I'm done. And so thank you very much. And I think I can handle a couple of questions. If not, we can do them in the, uh, in the panel discussion. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Mark. Any questions from the panel? I will ask one question. Um, you mentioned a little bit the comparison of the observations of the data, comparing them with models, and also the question of interference and occupancy. So what do you find to be the, the biggest challenge? Were there some discrepancies between the data that was collected and the expected models when you compared that? Or is it really more important in terms of trying to understand the occupancy and interference? Actually, that's a great question, Ashley. It gets to the crux of the effort. What we did is we worked, this effort was done on behalf of the wireless carriers. And what we did is we worked with them to back out proprietary KPI data on the operational parameters of their systems, which when these initial analyses were done, there was no way to do that. Um, and so all they had, uh, I believe these were analysis done uh, through CSMAC work. All they had was the data that's typical for you know these handsets. Uh, that are published by the manufacturers. When we actually applied real KPI data in terms of busy hour usage and that, um, we were able to actually uh, uh, co correlate that to the measurement data and determine the the impact primarily was the application of KPI. So in fact, handset powers had a, 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 a time duration, a, time, a duty cycle and whatnot, and, and other power limitations. And those are things that we actually saw in the data. Um, and I should mention, we had about four and a half million data points with all of this, so uh, there was tons of data. Uh, that was the main thing we found. Great, thank you. I'm sure we'll come back to this discussion as we move through. Great. So the next talk is by Michael Schwab, um, and it's a great segue as he is a vice president and partner, partner at Umlaut. Um, over 25 years of experience in electrical engineering, wireless communication, systems engineering, and interference mitigation, as well as business development. He has a degree in electrical engineering, um, and he's been at UMOT for more than 18 years, um, since 2001, and in the United States since 2010, um, working on benchmarking um, for networks, also hunting mitigation um, for interference, and recently with telecom security and cybersecurity. So with that, I will pass it over to Michael. Hello, thank you very much for having me on the panel and the kind introduction. So I'm coincidentally pilot two as Mark, uh, as he just announced. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes on the data collection and, and monitoring to focus on two aspects, obviously interference uh, and air interface security. The network carriers are collecting a huge amount of network performance and spectrum information. The data is typically used for regular monitoring of the network to identify performance uh, issues, outages and also capacity issues, as an example on cell level or wider geographical area. The data can also be used for network optimization and troubleshooting. The availability of so-called network counters depends on the run vendor, as all of have their own understanding of standards and implementation. Moreover, it depends on the ready access technology, software releases, etc. And the maturity of the deployment also plays a role vendors initially focus on the most important information and roll out more later on. As a transition to my next slide, or second slide already, I'm just to forward. Um, network carriers have the ability to monitor 
the, uh, the spectrum and or on an aggregated level on PRB level for LTE as an example. This is available for all frequency bands used by cellular carriers. In contrast to this, spectrum information is not available in downing direction as the handsets of have obviously different capabilities and are much smaller compared to a big base station. The downing information is recorded by the network, but also by crowdsourced data providers such as Umlaut to further use the data for optimization. And next slide, please. With the cap capability of spectrum monitoring, the network carriers has also the possibility to identify external interference. Operators spend billions of US dollars to license a few megahertz of spectrum and want to assure that they can use the spectrum properly. In the field spectrum will lead to performance degradation. When a network operator licenses a spectrum, the frequency band is neither cleared of interference nor pre previously legally operated devices. If you look at the rather recent 600 megahertz uh, edition, similar devices are causing problems as for the 700 megahertz spectrum deployment 10 years ago. Just as an example, a lot of wireless microphones are still operating in the 600 megahertz spectrum. We found a lot of these in, in churches back then and now again. There's a tendency that low bands are much more often externally interfered than mid bands and higher frequencies. It will be interesting to see which kind of devices will be active in the upcoming CBS bands. Millimeter wave bands are much cleaner though. RG requires a cleaner RF spectrum compared to LTE and UMTS to achieve higher spectral efficiency. Hence, there might be an additional need to clear the spectrum, which was doing fine for older radio access technologies. Although the mentioned wireless microphones are intentional radiators, a lot of external interference problems are caused by non-intentional radiators in the band of interest. The picture on the right shows you one of the most common offenders harming 700 megahertz networks since uh, more than 10 years and uh, are certainly also interfering with the 600 megahertz band. The cable TV ICRUS issue are occasionally also impacting 850 megahertz bands, which are used for UMTS, LTE, and just recently used for dynamic spectrum sharing between 5G and LTE. Cable TV ECRS problems are very often caused by bad installation quality and questionable maintenance. In the picture, you can see a cable TV amplifier, the gray box in the line, and several coaxial splitters, um, including a huge amount of loose cables connecting to the splitter. You can imagine it's only a matter of time, wind, weather, or animals until the TV signal is irradiated. Other very frequent interference devices for cellular uh, networks are cell phone boosters, wireless um, phones designed for foreign markets, like tech phones, wireless um, cameras, light ballasts and light fixtures, as well as baby monitors. So this list fits nicely to the list that Anita Weisen shared in an earlier session today. Network carriers monitor interference, but they're only addressing a fraction of the interference issues if performance degradation is really very bad. Most major carriers in the US address certainly far more than 1,000 external interference problems annually. It would be certainly of interest to further analyze the available data to estimate the actual amount of interference problems and impact on coverage. Interference mitigation can be lengthy and costly process, especially if offenders are not cooperative and the FCC needs to be involved. The offenses can become costly for the offenders as well. The vast majority of interference problems are kind, so kindly resolved with the support of the culprit without any financial impact of the culprit. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to jump to a different topic, air interface security. The straw to connect to the two topics is obviously interference. There are plenty of measures in place to reduce and limit the possibilities of impersonation interception and tracking of cell phone users in place. 5G will further enhance possibilities. However, the setup is also becoming much more complex, especially in the non-standalone mode, when three or even four radio access technologies are running in parallel. This opens new tech vectors. 5G will not yet entirely overcome the possibility of air interface security concerns caused by fake base stations. 
Come back to the interference topic. Intentional interference can be used to downgrade 5G connections. If certain 5G frequencies are unable or unusable, and a fake base station is best available cell, the handset may use the fake base station. Especially in older radio access technologies, there are easier ways to actually intercept the traffic and be the man in the middle. For a few hundred dollars, you can build um, such fake base stations with some knowledge, of course. Um, network carriers may need to establish additional monitoring and also use crowd source data to localize more uh, stingrays, so called, which is another name for fake base stations. Earlier today, we learned from True Moin of T Mobile about the efforts of uh, the T Mobile carrier about fake base stations. The Umlaut does a lot of uh, drive testing globally. The data allows us to analyze the radio information in regards to security concerns. Not all carriers, what we observe, have the same air interface related mechanisms in place. Default configurations or other misconfiguration may be an example to reduce the usage of best available encryption. I would like to stop here as my time is over and hand it back to Ashley. Thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you, Michael. We have one question um, from the participants watching. Can you quantify or elaborate on the statement that was made in one of your slides that 5G requires a cleaner RF spectrum compared to LTE and UMTS? Um, yes, certainly. So this was already the case um, when you compare UMTS versus LTE. Um, so the technology support lower noise um, floors. Um, and if certain uh, criteria are not fulfilled, then uh, higher modulation and coding schemes cannot be applied, um, which is a, a factor for high throughput, as an example, and uh, higher performance. Great, thank you. Any questions from the panelists? Yes, Kaushik. Uh, can you try again? I think you're still on mute. Okay, yeah, you are still not coming through. Um, so if you can hold that question and we will come back to you. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and move on to the next panelist and hopefully we'll get the audio worked out um, with, with that. Um, so the next panelist, it's really interesting that we discussed um, unintentional interference, but then there was a little bit of a move to the intentional interference. So that's a perfect segue to the next speaker. I'm Dr. Bob Baxley. So he is the co-founder and the chief technology officer of Bastille, which is the first cybersecurity company to detect and mitigate threats from the Internet of Things. Um, prior to starting Bastille, he was the director of the Software Defined Radio Lab at the Georgia Tech Research Institute. So he has expertise in signal processing, machine learning, radio frequency projects, um, and is also the inventor of 27 patents related um, to radio frequency wireless signals. So um, with that, I will pass it over to Bob um, for his presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ashley. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Um, so I thought I'd give a little bit of context about what we're doing in Bastille. And um, before I do that, at the very highest level, we've built a software-defined radio system that detects emitters in enterprise facilities. Um, let me motivate that problem though. So if you click to the next slide, and uh, one more. Uh, so the, the highest level, there's billions of emitters out there. There's billions of cell phones, billions of Bluetooth devices, click billions of Wi-Fi wi devices, and then billions of IoT devices. And of those IoT devices, the vast majority of them have radio interfaces. These radio interfaces, they're they're not all just uh, those kind of big Big name protocols you've heard of, there are things like Zigbee, there's proprietary protocols, long, long uh, low power WAN protocols like LoRa and Sigfox. There's a whole bunch of protocols in the spectrum. And these devices end up in your corporate facilities and the federal facilities, and they create a new attack surface for your, your, um, your cybersecurity perimeter. So if you go to the next slide, please. 
Um, in addition to the phones and the Fitbits and things that you, you know about, laptops that run on Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and cellular, you've also got covert wireless in, in enterprise facilities, things like decked headsets where maybe confidential conversations are being had, uh, IoT devices like light bulbs, audiovisual systems in boardrooms and meeting rooms. On the upper right is a thermostat, so building control systems like that. And thermostats these days tend to be Linux boxes on your wall with multiple RF interfaces associated with them. And then even computer peripherals like mice and keyboards. You might not know that know this, but most mice and keyboard manufacturers roll their own 2.4 gigahertz protocol to push the data between the dongle and the mouse and the keyboard. Most of them don't use Bluetooth. Um, so what this means for corporations and, and people with sensitive data is you've got this big unmitigated attack surface. Next slide. And maybe to make that a little easier to think about, you can think about what enterprises do to protect data on their wired network, corporate networks. There's a whole industry of intrusion detection systems, network access control systems, firewalls, advanced persistent threat detection systems uh, that, that cybersecurity firms sell to big companies so they can monitor the network traffic in their facility. Um, but beside Bastille, there's no unless you have Bastille, you probably have no visibility into all the RF networks in your space. And you may not even realize that some of your devices, some of your industrial control systems, have RF interfaces that aren't being used, that have default credentials, or maybe you have other unmanaged RF interfaces um, that you don't realize. So what we do at Bastille is we help you understand what those devices are in your space so that you can adjudicate them. Uh, so two slides. So what do we do? Um, we deploy software-defined radio sensors in your facilities. So there, this, this device on the right, it's a little bit bigger than a Wi-Fi access point, and you're deploying them in a similar kind of density as your Wi-Fi access points. On that software-defined radio sensor, we're doing digital demodulation of dozens of protocols across hundreds of channels. And that lets us see the L1 and L2 traffic, the unencrypted traffic from emitters in a facility. We see those emissions from multiple sensors, which lets us geolocate the, each device inside a facility. And once you can do that, we have packet information so you can get things like MAC addresses, you can understand manufacturers, sometimes you can understand the model, you can understand which devices are connected to each other and the volume of data flowing between devices. And with all, those, all that information, you can set your device policy rules for your facility. Fine. Uh, so an example policy rule that, that is popular with our customers is, is a Bluetooth pairing policy. Um, so you may, we have customers who have policies where Bluetooth emitters are allowed as long as they don't connect to anything, um, because that connection may imply that data is moving back and forth. So if you have a really secure facility, maybe you don't want any devices in your facility that have a network connection, and this constitutes a network connection. Um, so what may happen is you have a facility where you keep phones outside the facility in a locker, which maybe allow Fitbits to come in, and a user has no idea or maybe doesn't know that the Fitbit is still paired with the phone or that the headset that has a microphone is still paired with the phone. With Bastille, we can see both ends of that connection, localize both ends, and understand if there is a connection or if the device is no longer connected to the phone. And then our users can use that data to, to have alerts, and if they see a violation, they can send someone in to turn off the connection. Click. Uh, so another example is, is cell phones. So we can see cellular emitters, UEs inside of space, and localize those. And we see them distinctly. So we see a dot per phone. Um, as, as I'm sure all this audience knows, cellular uh, devices have really ephemeral identifiers like RENTIs. Um, so we don't have persistent identity, but we are able to tell you there is a phone here, and this is approximately where it is. Next slide. So with all that data, you can have policies like these devices are allowed. You have policies around your network connections. You can have geofence policies. This device is allowed in a room. This device isn't. And then with our APIs, you can connect those policies to automated actions. So if a policy alert is tripped, you can have an instant response system create a ticket. You can alert an IT security person via phone, email, um, SMS. You can use agents on devices. So MDM is an agent on have agents on your computer. And if those devices go into the wrong area, you can disable them. 
or you can wire up Bastille's alerts into your physical security system. You can, for instance, slew a camera into a room where a device policy violation has just occurred. So how do we do that? Uh, we do that by with, with our sensor arrays. So our sensor arrays have two software-defined radios in them. We've created them from, you know, from scratch. Uh, they've got integrated antennas. They're power over Ethernet. Um, we've got their passive, so they're FCC certified that there's no emissions coming off of the sensor. We're not having to interrogate devices. And with uh, all the demodulation happens in FPGA for the most of it, which lets us see, for instance, all 79 Bluetooth channels all the time simultaneously. We're not having to jump around and, and try to try to follow the hopping pattern of frequency hopping emitters like Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy, and Zigbee. Next slide. And then it's an enterprise security system. So the, the setup is you deploy sensors to your facility. Maybe you have many facilities across the, the world. And at each facility, there's a, a on-site appliance that the sensors talk to. That's called a concentrator. And your concentrators are talking back to one central fusion center. And ultimately, you have operators wherever, wherever they need to be who can see the user interface that the fusion center is exposing. And they can use that user interface to decide where dots are and um, adjudicate device policy violations. Um, and so that's that's the that's what we're doing at Bastille. I'll, I'll pause there and turn it back over to Ashley. Great, thanks Bob. We have a question, if you could answer how many monitoring sensors are needed to geolocate and what is the signal energy level that is needed to detect? You know, how close in proximity do the cell phones or the, um, the problem need to be? And then, Secondly, if you could just speak a little bit, if this type of technology um, could be expanded, you know, outside of a, a building, is, is there some interesting applications to geolocation of interference um, on a larger scale? Sure. Um, so the number of sensors we use, um, you need multiple sensors to see an emitter. You, know, you need at least three. Uh, you would like to have five. Our deployment model is we put a sensor every 50 to 70 feet. It's hard to, to peg down exactly how loud an emitter has to be before we see it. It, it kind of depends on um, if there's processing gain, coding gain that we get when we when we demodulate the signal, and it also depends on how far away that device is from an emitter. I mean, from one of our sensors. Um, yeah. So for larger scale spectrum monitoring, so this is a, a kind of an application of spectrum monitoring, except it's it's not analog monitoring. It's it's digital decoding, and we're really only looking at specific protocols where we know devices are. Um, we, we do have the ability to do spectrum monitoring where we measure power and bands, but most of our customers aren't that interested in that. As far as scaling it out, of, yeah, you could deploy as large of a Bastille network as you wanted. And, you know, one thing we've thought through is it may be that customers could expose their Bastille data in an anonymized way to, um, you know, a government agency so that you can get distributed monitoring without having to pay for all the distributed sensors, piggyback off the investment that companies are already putting into their local spectrum monitoring installations. Great, thank you. Um, before we move to the next speaker, I wanted to do a quick audio check. Um, Kaushik is back with us. Um, yes, I'm back. Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Thank you. All right, great. Oof. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we will move to our next speaker. I see there's a few more questions that we'll return to after all of the presentations are done. So our next presentation is by um, Jim Arnold. He works for the Department of Transportation where he has served as the Senior Spectrum Manager and Spectrum Lead in the Office of Positioning, Navigation, and Timing um, since January 2014. But he has more than 30 years of experience in research before transitioning to more policy work and he has his Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering from the Florida Institute of Technology. So with that, I will pass it over to Jim for his presentation. A bit of a different, uh... okay, now I'm unmuted, I'll talk again. <laughs> um, so from a, uh... Thank you, Ashley, and good afternoon to everybody on the uh, on the uh, on the the session here this afternoon. Um, so I do work for the Department of Transportation. We take a slightly different perspective on uh, on on how we how we communicate. Let me go to the next slide, please. 
So transportation uses many different types of communications for many different use cases. Uses differ by need, geography, population density, and different types of travelers' needs. As automation comes along, we expect automated vehicles and infrastructure to also integrate various types of communications. 5G is expected to be a part of these different use cases. However, we will have to approach 5G in a way that probably nobody else does uh, from a communications perspective. Our vehicle to X or vehicle to everything communications are predominantly non-networked uh, to, provide, to provide critical uh, transportation services. It is a highly tailored form of communication that can be used for machine to machine in a rapidly moving environment. Uh, you, know, you look at the intersection there, the, the bottom center, you've got a lot of different vehicles, a lot of things going in different directions. They all have to know where everybody else is going. We don't have time to set up the uh, a network uh, to get access to the network and communicate through that network. So we do it in a broadcast method. All devices in the area from, from an ad hoc mesh network of sorts out to approximately 300 meters. And that's the vehicle to vehicle side of it. Then we have the vehicle to infrastructure side, which offers the ability to do a form of edge computing. So we've, we've got a lot of different things coming into play here. Next slide, please. This type of communication allows us to address crash, crash conditions in real time and move toward a zero crash transportation environment. Uh, in this respect, such direct communication offers game changing enhancements in vehicle safety and mobility. We have V2V communications where we have messages that are broadcast from each vehicle at a rapid rate, roughly 10 times a second, depending on the application. And, to, and receiving vehicles use that information to determine if there is a potential for collision. And for either warn the driver or in the future, the, you know, warn the vehicle to, to take an evasive action. We have infrastructure, we have the roadside devices um, used to wirelessly notify drivers of traffic signal information what we call signal phase and timing, uh, work zone locations, lane closures, other roadway anomalies, um, to both enhance safety and reduce congestion. So we're really trying to, to, to move from a, we're trying to give the vehicles more situational awareness so they, that they can avoid crashes and make more efficient use of the transportation, transportation infrastructure. Next slide, please. Because our signals are, uh, is primarily a broadcast signal within an ad hoc network, there isn't a way to really monitor the spectrum and adjust with the devices. However, the devices are capable of monitoring their, their own spectrum use. Uh, we look at uh, the channel busy ratio and things like that, uh, and adjust power levels, adjust transmission rates. Uh, you know, 10 times a second is probably too often when you're sitting in a traffic jam. Uh, it's gonna reduce that a little bit. Um, And it's particularly important in places like Los Angeles for highways with over a thousand vehicles moving fast and forming these ad hoc networks as they go by as they go nearby each other, we're going over arterial streets. Uh you've there's a there's a lot of complicated uh interactions there. Um, you look at New York City where you've got roadside units that are located at potentially every intersection, uh less than you know, hundred meters apart. Uh, how do you how do you manage those and, and power and and, uh, and channel usage? So they have to be able to, to do that in real time on their own. Additional considerations for measurements include naturally occurring ground bouncer rolls, urban canyons, Doppler effects, foliage and building reflectivity, and other conditions of transportation environments across the nation. We are as a vehicle moves down the highway, it's it's the Vehicles is interacting with are changing. The environment's operating changes. Uh, you know, you go from an urban area to a suburban area to a rural area, uh, both urban and natural canyons. It's it's uh, quite a, a diverse environment that we have to have to work through. Next slide, please. So one thing we do is rather than uh, than uh, go out and actually look at the spectrum, we, we set up test uh, test systems. Uh, we have to reflect the conditions in order to collect the data that clearly reflects the radio performance and how it accounts for all these various variations in the environment. The same test, we use a variety of data visualization and capture equipment. Most notably, we've worked with the Institute for Technology Sciences in Boulder, create our own command and control system that allows us to monitor all devices under test at the same time. Uh, we have an upcoming test for 
uh, the LTE cellular field everything, where we're putting out some 250 different devices, and we might be able to monitor each one in real time. Uh, see what goes on, then pull all the data back and do some further analysis in detail. Um, so we can see all the over the air exchanges as they're happening, and again, uh, post process this to look them in more detail. As 5G is modified to work in, this, in the mid band spectrum ranges, uh, it modified to form the ad hoc networks from vehicles, mobile devices, and infrastructure based broadcast. We also use uh, some ourselves to test uh, methodology to see how it works, ensure that it can perform for crash avoidance, safety of life applications in a wide variety of challenging transportation environments. And I will note that the graphic is not done to scale, um, but it gives you a general perspective on, on what the uh, what our test configurations might look like. Next slide. But moving over to, toward a zero trust environment. From a transportation perspective, we actually broadcast everything in the clear, but we had a certificate to ever to a to message every so often, and that certificate allows us to verify that the uh, sender is actually within the uh, is operating within the constraints of the of the network. We look for for misbehavior misbehaving devices and our misbehavior detection, and we also offer very strong privacy protections. Uh, we're set up at this point so that our, we actually change MAC addresses every, I want to say it's every five to 50 seconds. So you really, it is nearly impossible, as far as we can tell, it is impossible to actually track a single vehicle traveling down the road because it's always changing. Um, yeah, where was that one? And that's it, back to you, Ashley. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, one quick question. Wanted to ask you. Um, do you need a dedicated system, or can you use the 5G system? And kind of related to that, someone um, in the Q and A asked, "Will DSRC be separate from 5G? You know, will the base stations be used for the for the vehicle communications in in the DSRC spectrum?" So if you could address that, that would be helpful. So depending on the application, uh, you can use a, a 5G network system. You can use an LTE system. Uh, you know, there are systems out there today that are, that are in use. Uh, think of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of some of the, uh, the Google applications where you're, you're uh, going from point A to point B and using that. Um, from a safety standpoint, you know, we're sending uh, sending messages at this point 10 times a second. That's every 100 milliseconds. And you've got to have time for the Beagle that receives that to calculate the potential for impact. Um, often it's a fairly quick uh, quick solution. You're too far away, nothing's going to happen. Or, you know, there's, there's a greater potential for an impact. Uh, you've got to be able to, both, both systems have to be on the same, essentially the same channel. And it has to be pretty much a dedicated system. You have two different systems. You're trying to translate between them, or if you're trying to go to the infrastructure associated with that, creating a network and going back to the vehicles, it takes too long. Uh, we've actually done some testing with, uh, this was several years ago, so I don't know if it still applies. We were trying to measure the time it took to associate with a network, uh, connect and data into the network and get back, and it was taking uh, something of just over a second which from a crash imminent perspective is way too long. Um, will 5G base stations be used for VDX communications and DSRC spectrum? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we've, uh, we're looking at, at how we would transition from one communication technology to another, and there really aren't any good answers just yet. Um, we know that uh, Whatever is chosen today will not be available in 30 years. Uh, so there has to be a, a way to transition. How we do that is, is still a question. Great, thank you, John. 
And I'll read one question for you to start thinking about as I transition to the final panelist. Um, is Department of Transportation considering vulnerabilities when you move from a controlled test environment to the real world environment? So you can be thinking about that. And the reason I want to transition to our final speaker um, is he has a lot of experience with um, spectrum emulators and, and modeling and also real world. So I think it's something he, he'll be addressing a little bit. And then we'll return to that question in the panel discussion. Um, so our final panelist is Dr. Kaushik Chowdhury. He is a professor in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at Northeastern University um, and seems to wear many hats as he's also a director in the Institute for the Wireless Internet of Things, a faculty fellow, um, and is also co-directing the Coliseum RF Network Emulator and also involved with the Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research Project Office. Um, so very active. He's won numerous awards um, early in his career from four or five different agencies, including NSF and DARPA and the Office of Naval Research. Um, he has his PhD from the Georgia Institute of Technology um, and it has research interests that span a, a breadth of, of areas, including deep learning for wireless sensing and spectrum access, networked robotics, um, and also wireless RF energy harvesting. So a lot of really interesting topics. So with that, I'll pass it over to you um, for the final presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Okay. Great. So, um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, a way in which we can obtain this data that, uh, you know, we, we heard so far about how important data sets are and, and uh, uh, you know, by proper monitoring of these data sets, you can find uh, people who are the legitimate users, people who are uh, intentionally or perhaps uh, unintentionally uh, issuing uh, undesirable emissions in the spectrum. So the question now is, these data sets are important. How do you collect them? And uh, what are the tools and methods that you have as a researcher, as an academic, as, a, as an industry person, or as the government to get access to these data sets? And, uh, and I'll talk about some of these experiences that I have been involved in in this, uh, in, in this brief talk. So please, uh, if you can go to the next slide. So, here are the four main focus areas where I feel that uh, these are the sources of uh, 5G data sets. So you already heard about the institutional data sets that uh, the NTIA has been collecting. There's a vast repository uh, from NIST as well. So these are, so some of these are publicly, publicly accessible, some of these are not. So uh, one of the things we need to do is to build relationships and, and make it easy for governmental agencies to share these data sets with the rest of the community. So that's something that, uh, that, that we need to do. On the extreme right hand side, uh, you see the importance of crowdsourced data sets. Now, uh, here's an example, FlightAware, which, which tracks uh, airplanes using the signals that they transmit is a crowdsourced uh, sort of a data set. But you can already see the value of this data set. Now, if it takes a, what, a couple of hundred dollars for someone to set up a base station and, uh, and emit uh, spurious uh, out of signals into the environment, then a similar few hundred dollars could be used in a crowdsource mechanism to involve concerned citizens where they can become part of the spectrum monitoring process. So what are the incentives uh, that could be made available for a crowdsource spectrum sensing environment? This is to me, I think is a fundamental problem and I'll come back to it uh, towards the end of this talk. But what I primarily I'm going to focus on are these two kinds of data sets that we can collect, right? One is the experimental data set, and I'll focus a little bit on the power platforms. And the other one is the emulated data sets in which you can have repeatable uh, virtual worlds, where you can test things without going in the wild. And that will go to the Colosseum. So next slide, please. So um, I've been very fortunate to be involved as part of the power project office. Now the power uh, program is a hundred million dollar uh, cash and in-kind contribution uh, program, which is uh, led by the NSF, as well as a consortium of industry companies. And what they do is, uh, here we are tasked with, uh, as the Power Project Office, we are tasked with um, selecting and then overseeing the operations of uh, city scale or community scale experimental platforms, which really push the boundary to something which you can do over the next five to 10 years, which you cannot do inside a small lab. Uh, so these are really experiments in the wild. And uh, so these are the three platforms that are being awarded so far. And uh, these different platforms are at different stages of their operational capability and are being developed as we speak. 
And so here's some, uh, some, some ideas on what kind of data, data sets that you can collect. So from the powder data set in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, you can collect data sets related to software defined networks, uh, uh, fully programmable uh, stacks. Uh, you can actually run a 5D stack on, uh, on, a, uh, on, on in the real world um, on, a, uh, on, a, on the powder platform. You have uh, the massive MIMO base station that is currently deployed. There's a 32 element base station and the uh, higher order uh, 64 element base stations are coming. There's Cosmos, which has uh, deployments in, uh, in New York City in which you can experiment on millimeter wave and full duplex uh, uh, data sets. There's AirPower, where you can now mount base stations on UAVs and have base stations on poles and then have interesting 5G uh, uh, dynamic connectivity and testing in a, in a real mobile and aerial mobile environment. And here are um, two additional rural black uh, broadband platforms that are upcoming. You will hear more announcements on this uh, around uh, towards the end of this year. So these are rich sources for you to go ahead and and perform experiments and obtain this data from actual devices in the wild. Uh, these are uh, this again scale uh, 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 over 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 the community. So so you can actually see the effect of interference of mobility of uh, of human actions of vehicular traffic in the wild. Um, so these are the power platforms and the take-home message is we need to use these more to reduce the time from experiment conception to data set creation. So you really don't need to invest the time in going to a place you can just log in remotely and obtain these data sets. So next slide, please. So the, the next one uh, is uh, emulation. So often uh, an experiment or, or perhaps collecting a data set uh, activity is not mature for the wild yet. So in those cases, you want to have an emulated environment where you can create a virtual world and uh, and you should be able to test a variety of different uh, protocols, um, uh, transmission parameters, configurations in a perfectly safe environment, which is repeatable. So here comes the Colosseum. The Colosseum was used for the DARPA Spectrum Collaboration Challenge. And after the, the challenge was over, it has transitioned over to Northeastern University. And uh, at core, it's a massive channel emulator. It can perform a, a full matrix that is 256 into 256 uh, ch channel emulation. Uh, you, there can be 128 programmable radio nodes, and each such radio node is an X310 USRP, uh, which has two daughter boards in it. So you can imagine it's a pretty large scale uh, system. And on each such uh, uh, software defined radio, you also have uh, compute resources such as uh, and NVIDIA GPU and other CPUs to, to run as a host. Now, the take of a message here is that because you have such a system, um, you have to be careful about what data you want to focus on and be conscious about the scale of the data. For example, Colosseum generates more data than, uh, than there are, say, bits in the uh, Library of Congress per second once uh, if, you, if you operate all these SRNs at the same time. So, uh, so here is it. What do you do with all this data? You'll be swamped with it unless there's a plan to take only what you need. So next slide, please. Uh, can I go to the next slide? Yeah. I think, sorry, there was, I think, uh, can we, uh, one back, one back. One more back. Anyway, all right, so, uh, uh, so let's go forward one. Maybe it got skipped somehow. Okay, so one of the things that uh, even if you collect these uh, these large scale spectrum uh, da data sets, the question now is how do you share them? Um, so we are a big proponent of standardized language for sharing. And um, so one of the things that, uh, and you heard this being spoken earlier is the SIGMF format. Now this format is, uh, is Something not that not not just NTI uses, but also we use ourselves when we create our data sets. So what we do is um, we can uh, collect and save them uh, in a format that makes it easy to share. There are a number of different parameters of both the transmitter systems, the the uh, the frequency, the bandwidth, and all these different features that you can uh, compactly represent in a meta format. So here's an example of a of a SIGMF representation, and you can download this data set. It's for RF fingerprinting basically emitter detection. 
and you can freely download this that we have collected ourselves. But just to show you that whatever we create, we should be able to share them. And we need a standardized way uh, for this kind of uh, uh, information sharing. So with that, uh, I think I'll stop here and then we can have a couple of more uh, discussions uh, uh, following this. Great, thank you. When you talk about the need for standardized data sets, how usable are existing data sets when you try to, to access and, and do studies? Could you speak to that? So there's always going to be a problem on what existing data set can you use as is. Now, when we went back and we tried to look at um, what data sets are available, you'll often find that uh, it may not be very relevant and current in the sense you may not find a lot of, say, um, 5G NR waveforms that are being transmitted over the air and you've collected these 5G NR waveforms to the receiver in an interference environment. That data set may not exist uh, publicly, at least for an academic to use. So, uh, so I will say that um, it's, I'm not very, I'm not very, uh, 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 or, or what I believe is that we need a spectrum aggregation or a data factory, as you may call it, right? If we are in the data revolution today, then what's going to drive it is a data factory, and we don't have that. So that's what we need to create, and we can do this through these power platforms, Colosseums, and other data sets that are, that are available. Great, thank you. So that brings me to a question um, that was asked, and if a, the panelists just raise your hand if you'd like to address it. And given the focus on the benefits of the expanded monitoring, what precautions do operators of the monitoring equipment need to be aware of to avoid violating the nation's wiretap laws and, and generally making sure that it's anonymized appropriately such that um, you're able to share these data sets. Any comments? I know, Michael, for example, you've done some work um, you know, specifically for wireless carriers, but your company also does some more generalized work. What What is the difference there in terms of, you know, when you collect data that you release and publish more broadly versus um, when you're doing, you know, work that's private? I mean, as long as we collect the data for um, measurements that we do ourselves, um, um, I don't see a big issue. It's more the passive data collection, whether you collect spectrum, although, if you only collect spectrum information, you may not, uh, certainly not able to easily decode. So there's, you can only identify there is some usage, um, but I'm, I'm also not uh, in the legal domain. For our court sourced um, data collection, certainly there are a, a lot of rules to follow. Um, similar things that the FCC experienced back then when they collected their own data or, or called data program uh, as well. So there are, of course, in Europe, uh, GDPR um, regulations to follow. I think there's a strong one also in California. Um, so that would be my answer. Any other comments on that question? Okay, seeing none, um, I'm going to return to the question that was asked um, just after Jim Arnold's talk. Whether the DOT is considering vulnerabilities to the intelligent transportation systems when you move from a test environment to a real world environment. And it would also be great if any other panelists wants to weigh in on um, challenges or vulnerabilities that you've seen um, in the real world environment um, from maybe things that were not expected when you model a system. So I'll start with you, Jim. Thank you, Ashley. Um, yes. So I will start out by saying that transportation professionals tend to be very risk averse. They really want to make sure that things are working very, very well before they introduce them to the public. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's really quite surprising how long it takes to move from uh, from a final developed product to deployment. Um, and as part of that process, yes, we do some very one-on-one -on -one control testing. We do some larger field testing where we have multiple vehicles in a very controlled environment. And then we do a small scale or even a larger scale uh, model deployment. And it's in those model deployments we tend to, to run across issues that we wouldn't see in the, in the smaller tests that we have to resolve. And that is well before it goes out to the general public. Um, it's, that's one of the reasons it takes so long to move things from, from, a, from concept to deployment in, in the transportation arena. 
you know, I like I love the example of the uh, video detectors for uh, for intersections. Uh, we used what we call loop sensors, wires buried in the road, uh, to detect vehicles going over there for years and years and years. And uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, there was the development of of a video technique that could detect whether or not it, but if there was a vehicle in the entering the intersection. And it took 15, 20 years for that uh, that technology to become widespread. So, and, and that was a fairly basic thing. But we didn't want to. We want to make sure that the that folks didn't uh, that when they pulled up to the to the traffic signal, they were actually detected. Um, because we all know when we sit a traffic signal too long, we get impatient. Uh, I know I do. <laughs> uh, so we want to make sure that uh, that that the vehicles are recognized. But that, that's 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 an example. So we do in fact look at uh, at the at the larger scale de- model deployments, and even after that, we continue to collect data to make sure that the uh, that deployments. And what we're using is effective and meets the meets the needs. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, you know, so it's an interesting question. Um, we have often been called to do interference um, detection measurements, and uh, so in situations, and I think somebody mentioned the, tra- the 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 typical you know light ballast case. Um, but there, it's and it's interesting. So that's one situation we've had. Another situation we have in CBRS is a Spectrum Access Service a System Provider, a SAS. We had to work closely with the Enforcement Bureau to uh, address the the line between their responsibility and the SAS's responsibility for interference identification. Um, as most people know, the FCC has sort of decimated the Enforcement uh, Bureau to some extent through cost cuts. So um, and this is going to happen in six gigahertz with the automatic frequency coordinating system. So the, the, the one bright light we, line we have here is we're not at all collecting data sufficient for evidentiary proceedings. So, you know, if the misbehavior is related to just somebody really being an active rogue operator, um, we're not collecting that data. Uh, at least we aren't. We do our measurements um, and we're pretty clear about that. But if we're out there trying to do a troubleshooting measurement where, you know, the, all the, the parties, all they want to do is resolve the issue. Um, and actually, that was a question that came up earlier, too. How is that information shared? And, you know, a lot of it depends on who owns the data. And that's a big question we deal with often. But for the most part, the people we're dealing with are, are willing actors and um, they're, they want to resolve the problems. And I don't know, with exception, maybe one or two situations in my entire career where we've had, ha- actually had to get law enforcement involved. And those are because of people using jammers which they are, and, and I remember a specific situation, which we won't get into, where somebody was using a jammer and we actually found it and actually had to call the local law enforcement to have it removed. Um, but again, that's, that's an edge case. Um, so like I said, most of the data we collect is not it is really used to resolve the problems and it's resolved among the, the actors. That's helpful. Any other comments on vulnerabilities you've seen moving from you know, a test environment to the real world? I, I'm not sure about test environments or real world, but I can speak to some of the airborne vulnerabilities we've seen and that have been released in the, the security research literature. Um, so there's lots of people who have demonstrated various forms of malformed packet injection. If you've got a, a, digital, demo, a digital communication system and you send a packet that the parser is not expecting, you can do simple things like have the system restart. You could get the system to deadlock where it doesn't restart. And people have even demonstrated it over Bluetooth and Bluetooth Low Energy, for instance, being able to inject a carefully crafted sequence of packets to take over machines. So to get remote code execution on, on the whole constellation of machines, Linux, Android, Apple, and Windows boxes. Um, so I think, uh, and, and really it comes down to whoever wrote the, the protocol decoder on the system on chip that's doing the decoding, there's some corner case that didn't get taken care of very well. Um, so that's certainly a security issue when you're when you're thinking about these things. I, I, we're probably all maybe we remember back to when the Tesla was hacked at Black Hat uh, a few years ago. They were able to exploit some problem in the Wi-Fi credentialing of Teslas so that you can connect to the Tesla and then take over it and have it start <laughs> driving without authorization. Um, so it's definitely a very tricky space. I, there's no real easy answer except visibility of your interfaces and then pen testing and then quick patching when you find a vulnerability. 
Yeah, Kartik. Just, uh, well, just one quick follow up part here. When we started to look at this, uh, you know, we realized this problem as well. Uh, one approach that we could use to, to address some of this is perhaps to do something like an RF fingerprinting on trusted devices and do that at the physical layer. Even before bits are formed and sent up for processing, could we identify an emitter as a trusted one versus maybe someone that is masquerading or, uh, or just uh, an unauthorized transmitter? So could it be that the legitimate transmitter is just going off because its power amplifier is off? Or is it because um, someone new has come in the scene? So we could do that using RF fingerprinting. Uh, that could be one approach. One question I wanted to ask Bob that came in, um, there was a number of questions about if you restrict with Bastille um, the well-identified bands for cellular service, or if you scan from 25 megahertz to six gigahertz inclusively, and kind of related, do you plan to expand the frequency range from six gigahertz up to 7.125 since that band is opening up to Wi-Fi and other unlicensed devices? Um, sure, great questions. Um, the, so our scanning schedule is configurable. Uh, and, you know, there's some opportunity costs because the, the front ends, they can't see that entire range all the time. Um, so if you're looking at one band, you're not looking at another. Uh, we have some default configurations that we deploy for people. And most most customers choose to just look at the bands where they know traffic will be. And then occasionally scan bands where they're not sure if there will be traffic there. Um so that, there's a there's a little bit of a science to understanding when you scan, where you scan, and, and it depends on your use case. Uh, yeah, with the Wi-Fi, was it 6E um, up to 7, 7.1 gigs? Uh, I can't talk about our future product plans, but yeah, we've got we're we're thinking about how to address that. Great, thank you. So another question that just came in that's really interesting is, is there a plan or effort to measure the noise score again? It was noted in this question that the last time was in the 70s. And I will say from the radio astronomy perspective, with receivers that are a million times more sensitive than standard telecommunication devices, a lot of the rules were written for you know thresholds from a single device. And so the aggregate impact of a lot of devices really does matter. You want to know what the noise score is um, and how that may affect things in addition. So is, are any of the panelists aware of plans or efforts to measure the noise floor more broadly, specifically as it relates to 5G and your applications? Uh, Michael. I think if I remember correctly, there was a kind of RFI a few years ago by the FCC to receive information about how to realize such an effort, but I haven't heard uh, anything since. Great, thanks. I think that's a very good question. So we'll, we'll note it and I think continue to, to evaluate. So let me see, we have about seven minutes. There have been a couple um, folks who have liked a question that I think is, is really interesting. Um, I'm gonna direct this first towards Michael, but if there's other comments, please feel free to, to weigh in. Um, is there an effort across the carriers to share interference reports to help with the resolution and document known signals? And also related to this, it might be interesting if you address the, the issue of the unintended transmitters and if there's any documentation of, um, you know, like you mentioned, you know, devices like the, the wireless microphones and this idea of trying to understand a, a system's lifetime and when you might be getting interference from an old wireless device and do carriers share that information as well. Yeah, I think Mark and I responded to this a little bit already via text. Um, the answers were slightly different. Um, I'm not aware of that the carers exchange this on, on a regular basis or if there's any communication channel that in the carriers. Um, there's certainly exchange because people uh, move around. Um, but this kind of spectral pattern will certainly be reported to the FCC uh, if there are escalations um, or if there are new devices, which occasionally happens, uh, that are suddenly showing up in the market and are causing interference. The FCC is able to collect this information. Great. And actually, Mark, yeah, I'd add to it that um, the carriers do, is what I put in the chat, the carriers do collaborate on, uh, you know, adjacent market issues when there's interference, before and after the fact. You know, they work together to ensure that they keep their signal strengths, you know, at, at limits uh, where, they, where they need to be. 
Uh, and the FCC rules generally require the carriers to collaborate on resolving matters of interference and they leave it at that. Um, so, you know, there's been several programs they've developed over the years to work on that. In fact, there are people that are responsible, they call it compliance, within the various carriers to ensure things like that happen, other electromagnetic compatibility issues and, and RF uh, exposure issues are dealt with. So th there's a process to do that. Um, we are familiar with a situation that occurred in the 2.3 gig band where there was a lot of work done between carriers when that first band was made available um, to collaborate on uh, coexistence issues. I'll just leave it at that. So there's a lot of work that gets done. It's mostly at the grassroots level between the carriers. Uh, and, it, you know, they get it worked out for the most part and you never hear about it. So, but it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's institutionalized other than them, you know, res responding to the requirement that they have to collaborate and cooperate on issues related to interference. Great, thank you. So the five minutes left, I want to give each panelist a few moments to just reflect on what you think the biggest challenge is in, in data monitoring and, and the biggest opportunity that we have, you know, in the coming, um, in the near future. So if you can think about kind of the biggest challenge that you see in, in data monitoring, whether it be technical or, you know, a policy level challenge, that would be great. Um, and then as you're kind of starting to think about that, I just want to remind the folks listening that there'll be a chance to join um, breakout rooms. So if you have a question that was not addressed, feel free to join the breakout room of, of that particular panelist and you can um, address those questions there. Um, so with that, I will start with Mark. Okay. You know, I think one of the big problems, or not challenges, is, is, is how to manage that, the data. Um, you know, we've gone now from having to actually be data scientists to manage that data. And so, you know, it's interesting. I mentioned CSMAC. Um, one of the recent CSMAC questions we've dealt with is how can NTIA get better data on commercial operations? And so we're realizing that, you know, the data comes from disparate sources, not just monitoring, but monitor monitoring, and then you correlate that with other data sources. So, I, you know, I think applying big data uh, uh, and data science uh, 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 applications to spectrum monitoring is probably something new that, that we need to deal with. We, we're aware of several companies that do do monitoring, one of them actually that does airborne monitoring, actually. And they are they collect, you know, when you collect IQ data from spectrum monitoring, it, you're getting a whole lot of data. So not only is it trying to um, do data mining, it's dealing with the, just the huge, huge amounts of data. Um, so I'd say that's one thing. And then there's, you know, I think you've seen it in the chat, probably some policy issues around, um, you know, who owns the data. Um, but, you know, for now, I think mostly what we're collecting is spectrum usage data. Um, and, you know, I think the data is owned by whomever collects it. So. Right. Um, Michael, what do you think the biggest challenge is? And I'll just throw out somebody commented, um, is incentive to collect data and aggregate um, one of the challenges or problems? Um, Michael. Uh, good question. Um, I mean, the, the amount of data is just increasing and, and the amount of uh, frequency bands, so there's much more work to do. The network carries are not necessarily um, increasing headcount in, in the engineering domain. There needs to be a lot more automation and uh, possibilities to, to deal with spectrum uh, issues rather than the old-fashioned manual way that someone is looking why uh, a certain sector is performing well and then he's busy for two hours uh, to find out its interference and then dispatches a company or going out and is busy for days to, to find the source. Great. Um, Bob? So I think... Um, more of an opportunity. I mean, there, there are so many RF devices out there that, that are implicit sensors. Um, if, if there was a, a connectivity layer where these sensors could already be exploited. So Bastille, we're pretty sophisticated sensors, but even your, theoretically your phone or, you know, low level consumer devices that are already internet connected, see some of this data, maybe even see harmonics that you could do some inferences on. Um, so that, the spectrum collaboration challenge was an interesting proof of concept where you could have a collaboration layer where the devices could communicate sensing information and then you could use these distributed devices that are already out there. And it's very expensive to do monitoring campaigns. Um, so if you could distribute that and use incumbent devices, that would be fantastic. That's great. And we're right at time. So kind of in 10 to 20 seconds, Jim, what do you think the biggest challenge or opportunity is? 
So I think I'll go along with uh, what other folks have said is the uh, the, uh, the data, and then how do you visualize that data? Uh, you know, that's 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 a big thing. We need to need a way to look at it and very quickly assess um, what opportunities are there. Great, thank you. And finally, Kashik. Well, I think there's a great opportunity in able to be able to combine uh, institutional data emulated data, experimental data, and crowdsourced data. And we need a, an entity that sort of aggregates, absorbs this, and makes it available to the community. The opportunity is really because, remember, to do this, to be successful, to continue to lead this movement in the US, uh, we need to train the next generation of wireless data scientists. And they can only do that uh, in educational institutions uh, as they grow up, as they start to see these data sets from the ground up. So we need to make this available to them. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much to all of our panelists, and I'll pass it back to our moderator, I think, to give any other instructions um, for the breakout rooms. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Zutter, and thank you, everybody, uh, for participating in the panel. Uh, so now, as you know, we're going to go into the breakout rooms for the one-to-one -one interaction. Uh, so for our panelists, please make sure to remember that you close the app uh, and click on the link for the breakout room so we don't have any crosstalk. Uh, for those that are participants, so you can access the breakout rooms in the ISART app, uh, or you can use the links in the confirmation email that you receive. So I look forward to seeing you in the breakout rooms, and thank you very much.